I, I like to think of it as it's much better to show people than tell people. And even when you're writing, even when you're writing a story, and this is what my editor would always uh, drill into me, don't just tell them what happened, show them, paint a picture, use descriptive words, make the reader feel what the character is feeling. So when you're telling a story in a business, you're showing people what the capabilities are. You're showing them uh, the possibilities. You're showing them and you're making them feel uh, what could happen, what could be possible, rather than just showing them data, showing them graphs, showing them reports. Have a story that goes along with that. Welcome to the Delighted Customers Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Slayton, and I'm so glad you're here. I empower leaders to turn indifferent customers into loyal fans. I talk to guests with a wide range of expertise who share meaningful insights and wisdom. We give you practical tips and proven frameworks and share ways to help you delight your customers. Well, I can't tell you how excited I am to have my guest on the show, Dennis Geelan. Dennis is a CX person. He has a CX background, engineering background. Uh, he is an author, a speaker, a coach. He pretty much does it all. And it's an honor to have him on the show. Dennis, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Mark. This is great. Yes. So today, we're going to talk about something a little bit different, something that I think is critical, and it's hard to believe in over 50 episodes, this hasn't come up yet, which is this the importance of stories and storytelling. And uh, we're going to talk about all about it, about why it's important, about when and how to do it, how it's structured. Uh, and we're going to talk directly to an author. Dennis. So Dennis, um, can you share with us a little bit about what you do and, and kind of how you got into the role that you're in now? Sure. I'll, I'll try and give you the, the brief version. But uh, about five years ago, I decided to go off on my own, started my own management consulting company, mostly doing uh, CX and innovation workshops and, and consulting. Um, but I also at the same time really started journaling my my journey uh, into solopreneurship. I, I'm, I'm a one-person consulting company, so a lot of people um, started following, taking note, uh, wanted to do the same thing. I wrote some books. Um, some people started, you know, asking me, "How did you start your own company? How did you write that book? How did you get that out there?" So now, I actually spend the majority of my time coaching other solopreneurs. So what an interesting background to build off of and launch launch into and then go into the customer experience world. And when when you really I know you're still obviously still have a foot in it, but when you were when you were um everybody kind of comes to it a, from a different place. Yours was innovation. That was a big part of it, wasn't it? Yeah, uh with my software background, I I I was blessed to have a few different roles. Uh, one, I managed software development teams and uh, research and development teams. So really got into the innovation side of things from a software perspective. But I also uh, was blessed to manage some professional services teams um, where we it really was important that the the clients, the customers of our software had a great experience both with us as a company implementing our software and with our software itself so that that's where the two worlds kind of collided cx and, and innovation all right so um so you you just have a fascinating background um i, I want to talk to you about stories because um I, I remember reading you know most business books are pretty much straightforward uh they're they're, they're how-to books on how to do a certain thing this or that and the other thing uh, and I remember Pat Lencioni wrote a series of fables, uh, and I really was drawn to them. He has this way of telling a story, and at the kind of the very, very end, he gives you the formula. Uh, Five Dysfunctions of, of Teams is one of his book, and Silos, Politics, and Turf Wars. 
um, and, and how, really how organizations can work together as a team and things about leadership. I read your book, The Accidental Solopreneur, and it really reminded me a lot of his writing style. I got, I found myself drawn into the story. I found myself identifying with the lead character and, uh, and uh, compelling, and it really made the case uh, for solopreneurship in general, uh, as I was entering into it early on about a year and a half ago. So what I want to ask you is, number one, what inspired you? Because I think Zero In was more of a traditional business book, but then you wrote this other book. So what inspired you to take this approach to writing this book? And, um, and, 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 and what inspired you to um, write, use that writing style? Well, uh, Patrick Lencioni was a big uh, inspiration. I, I absolutely love his books as well. It, it's it's very different when you're reading a story and the story you relate to it and you're learning from it at the same time. So, yeah, when I wrote the Zero In Formula, it was a more traditional nonfiction business book. Um, I was just explaining and I was giving examples and, and I maybe shared some other people's stories in the book, but I wasn't weaving a story. So when I wrote The Accidental Solopreneur, uh, initially I was going to write another traditional business book and I, I found it a great fun challenge to write the Zero In Formula, but I thought, okay, I've, I've done that. I've written a, a traditional business book. Let me challenge myself to write a fiction business book in, you know, in, in the realm of Patrick Lencioni. Um, so I thought this is going to be a great fun, new challenge. I found myself a good fiction editor and really wanted to do something similar to Lencioni where I can create these characters. I can create this drama. I can create this story and this conflict and really draw the reader in while teaching them a lesson through it. So that was, that was kind of my inspiration for doing it. And uh, and so you kind of alluded to this, but my, my question comes on the heels of that, uh, which is why are stories just so important? Yeah, so many reasons. I mean, well, there's the traditional saying, uh, you know, people make decisions based on emotion and then they justify them later with facts yeah. and data. So if I'm writing just a book and all I'm doing is giving facts and data, they're you know, underneath it all, there's some compelling arguments there, but it's not going to move people. Mm. If you really want to move people, if you really want to draw them in, a story has so many different uh, elements that can do that. And you're going to compel people, you're going to persuade people, you're going to engage people. So the stories just have that way of, of, of touching people. Yeah. And, and, and if you don't follow Dennis uh, on LinkedIn uh, and his newsletter, you should. Dennis, Dennis writes a newsletter all about um, luck, surface prep, luck surface area and improving your uh, happiness. Help, help me out with the exact words. You What's the name of the newsletter? The, the newsletter is called Happy, Happy Accidents, Accidents, and it's just true stories of accidental success, people that were putting themselves out there um, and then capitalizing on these different serendipitous moments that landed in their lap in one way, shape, or form. Okay. So you're, you're writing creative stories all the time um, and compelling stories and, and stories that move people and give people illustrations of how they can really apply some of the lessons in the stories but you know we can all sit down and we can tell a story we tell stories to people all the day about what happened to us in our day or our week or a trip or whatever but there is sort of a framework right if someone were wanted to get serious about writing either either posting or newsletters or a book um you, you know what's the formula there yeah i mean stories have been told and told throughout time right and and um, i don't know if if people were aware of exactly the different elements that they were putting into it but you know now that we have the benefit of history and going back and looking at some of the the best stories you can pull out well what are the elements that that make a great story and and there's several i mean 
A, you need to have a relatable character. You want the reader to relate with this main character to be able to feel what they feel, to be able to resonate and say, ah, oh, that was me, or I've been in that situation, right? So a relatable character is huge. Um, having a clear theme, what is it that is the theme or the moral of this story and making sure that that's abundantly clear to the reader. Um, there's humic, uh, humor, if you know, if, if you can really draw them in with uh, some, some, some humor in the story, if you're able to tug at their heartstrings, if there's able to be a lesson at the end, if there's able to be some conflict that the person overcomes, you know, there's different elements that can really um, engage and capture the, the reader's minds. So you, you've got the conflict, and I'm guessing at some point there's going to be some resolution. <laughs> Hopefully. That that makes for a, a, a great story. I, I don't know about you, but I've, I've watched a few movies where at the end it feels like, what, they didn't tie up some loose ends or they, they you know, the, the character didn't triumph or win and you always walk away a bit disappointed. So I, I think a great story does that. It It ties that up nicely in a bow and there's some resolution that you can walk away feeling good about. So as you, as, as just to use your book, um, accidental solopreneur as sort of a model, um, as you think about the story arc and as it developed, you know, share with the audience what the story arc was and did anything like, how did it evolve as you were thinking about or beginning to write the book? Yeah. And it, at the beginning, I did not have a great process for how should this flow. And that's where my editor really helped me and um, gave me a few different pointers. Um, there's the hero's journey, right? This is the, the the person that starts in one area, you know, develops some conflict, has to overcome that conflict, and then eventually, you know, reaches the summit. That's a very basic explanation of the hero's journey um and then there's another uh, version of that that pixar actually uh, does a really good job of and their their story spine is more of a you know once upon a time this thing was happening either to this person or to these people or or in this era and every day this would happen and then every day this would happen until one day something else happens and then because of that and then because of that and then because of that until finally, and then ever since then, this is what's going on now. So it's a, it's a you know, a different variation of the hero's journey, but a, a similar way of kind of pulling the reader or the viewer along through this storyline and this conflict and, and this drama uh, until there's some sort of resolution at the end. And, and it, it goes back, um, I, I mean, you think about the biblical stories of mm -hmm. you know, Cain and Abel or... Yep. Moses and Pharaoh, um, and, and and then all the Little Red Riding Hood and these these British all the British fables yeah. that you you read about, all the way to Star Wars and um, and uh, Indiana Jones and uh, adventures yeah. and, and so forth. So um, so the stories stories move us, as you said. They they create an emotional impact on us they get us to yeah you know if the goal if the goal is to just relate it's relate if the goal is to create action it's to create action in the business world typically what we're looking for is either support of of something we've already got in motion or approval to get something in motion with time money resources yeah. right so yeah, yeah. Tell me why, and I know it's going. It may sound a little bit redundant, but just to hit on this, why, from your perspective, are stories so important, especially in senior management in the C-suite? Yeah, I, I like to think of it as it's much better to show people than tell people. Mm. And even when you're writing, even when you're writing a story, and this is what my editor would always uh, drill into me: don't just tell them what happened; show them paint a picture, use descriptive words, make the 
reader feel what the character is feeling. So when you're telling a story in a business, you're showing people what the capabilities are. You're showing them uh, the possibilities. You're showing them and you're making them feel uh, what could happen, what could be possible, rather than just showing them data, showing them graphs, showing them reports. Have a story that goes along with that. Um, you know, one, one of the best ways to do that is if another company, if another leader has already done something similar, tell that story and, and maybe do it in the hero's journey version where this is where they were before. This is what was happening with that company. And then they did this. And then because of that, this happened. And then now, and then ever since then, here's where they are today, right? Take examples of of famous companies and, and where they've come from. And because they've done the thing that you're trying to, you know, get done within your company, that story is going to to resonate. Oh. And and like you said, stories have, stories have been around forever. And we remember stories, right? That's Jesus told parables to get his his uh, point across, right? It, it, he could have just stood there and said, you should do this, you shouldn't do that. Half the stuff he said then wouldn't be remembered. But because he used stories, people remember it and people can relate with it. And so we should be doing that within the business setting as well. Yeah, I, I think I think there's a couple of things that you just hit on that are just so important. Um, and I want to go back to a question that as you raised as well, that I want to bring up about my own struggle with storytelling or lack thereof um, is uh, this emotional connection and the red letters of the Bible and why, you know, Jesus moving people by telling stories and the stickiness of it. Um, it, 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 it reminds me of the made to stick book, um, which you and I have talked about where they talk about, yeah. Yep. The success formula, a simple, unexpected, concrete, credible, emotional stories are, are why some ideas survive and others die. And the mm -hmm. the reason they, they talk about this, and I, I'm really curious to get your opinion, is they talk about this Velcro theory of memory, which is yep. you know, the idea that stories activate both sides of the brain, both the logical uh, the rational and then the irrational or the emotional side. And when those are blended together, the brain like hooks and loops and, and Velcro, they, they make a real stickiness to them. What are your thoughts about that? I completely agree. People love good stories and it's, um, you can either tell a story or you can create a story for other people to tell. And a great example is from that book, Made to Stick. And actually, I think you 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 uh, shared this story in, in a post recently, maybe even today, that was also in that book, Made to Stick. And this is where the child leaves their uh, stuffed animal behind at a Ritz Carlton. Yeah, that was today. Right. Yeah. And that, <laughs> yeah. So I I read that first in in the Made to Stick book, and I thought, well, th that is amazing. So they had this culture where. The, the the people working there obviously felt they had the autonomy, felt that they had the flexibility to take this stuffed animal, take it all around the Ritz-Carlton, take all these pictures of it, sunbathing by the pool in a golf cart, whatever, and then sent uh, this photo album along with the stuffed animal back to the child that left it there. That is creating an amazing story. Now that family has a great story to go tell all these other people, they could have just said, Hey, we had a great time at the Ritz Carlton. They treated us ni nicely there. That's telling right now. They have this amazing story where they can show people exactly how amazing it was to stay at the Ritz Carlton and how well they were treated and how they went over and above because of this stuffed animal left behind and what the staff did with it and created this amazing story out of it. Yeah. Well, well, well said. And I didn't, I didn't know. I, I think I had probably even heard that story before I read it in the made to stick book. It's just, it's such a good, uh, mm -hmm. it's almost like CX lore, you know? Um, exactly. Yeah. Um, but, but it's your, the one thing you said is, is part of the culture that's, but for right now, let's, let's talk about the stories. And I want to ask you, so Dennis is, um, at full transparency, Dennis has been a coach of mine. I have, learn from his books and his, his other resources, but also I've used him as a, as a coach for my business and he's a great coach. So I'm going to ask you to do one. I'm going to ask, tell you about a challenge I have that I think other people may also have relative to stories. 
and I want you to coach me on the on the on the delighted customers podcast here and, and potentially embarrass me in front of everybody. <laughs> so so that is why why do I fall into the trap of not telling stories? I, I was in front of the C-suite at least once a quarter over nine years. And I I think about the opportunities that I missed by not telling stories. Yeah. Wh- why why I, do why do I and maybe some others can relate about doing exactly what you said not to do? Yeah, I, I'll I'll speak for myself here. I've been in that situation several times, and my personality is if uh, I'm, I'm sure we've all done different personality tests, right? right. There's the Myers Briggs, right. there's the Enneagrams, there's the True Colors. If I if I talk about the True Colors one for a second, I'm a I'm a green. And that's an analytical person. I like facts. I like numbers. I'm drawn to problem solving and analytics, right? So to me, I look at analytics. I look at, look at data and it tells me a story. And then I just assume I'll just share that data with other people and they'll see it too. But not everybody's a green, right? Not everybody has the same way of thinking as I do. Whereas a story can relate to everybody, right? But that's not my default. My default is numbers. So like you, I've made that mistake several times where I just show up at a senior leadership meeting. I've got the data. That's going to tell a story. Bam, no problem. This is going to, you know, handle itself. But, you know, maybe a small percentage of people in the room are like me and they're analytical. Um, You know, you've got your blues, you've got your oranges, you've got your your greens, your golds, everybody is a mixture of people. So a story can touch everybody. But for me, it, it's not my default. I have to remember to to craft that story or borrow a story um, to tell, to go along with the data. So I, I think you hit on something really. Uh, and, and, I, and I think like at any time you're going to have a conversation with someone, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be in the C-suite, but it's an important conversation. And either you're interested in gaining influence, and those of us in the CX space, maybe other spaces as well, tend to operate with very small departments, very small budgets, and uh, sometimes very limited positional power. So everything has to be done through influence and through other people. And stories are going to be even more important. So Maybe, and tell me what you think, maybe just hit the pause button before you go into that conversation or meeting and say, okay, I want to be effective at the, at the end of this thing. Maybe I ought to tell a story. What, what stories, and if I follow this model that you shared, yeah. either the hero's journey or the Pixar model, um, and use, use whatever's going on in my world to help tell that story, uh, in a relatable way. Um, th- does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I've had people say to me, well, I can't find a good story yeah. that would relate to this. Well, it doesn't have to be about the exact topic, right? What you can do is you can use stories and then yourself relate them. So an example there would be, I, I, I'm about to present something to senior management and senior management maybe has uh, a history of saying no, right? Maybe they're very risk averse. They don't like new ideas. And I'm bringing something that what they would see as maybe a radical new idea. So what I might do is I, I might start with the, the Kodak digital camera story. And for those of you who don't know, it was a, a, an engineer at Kodak named Steve Sasson that actually invented the digital camera in the 1970s. He brought it to management and management said, no, that's not what we do here. We're not into digital. Nobody needs digital. There's the infrastructure is not there. We, we're into instant printed cameras. So they, they, they blocked it. And about 10 years later, it was Sony that actually released the digital camera and went on, you know, to great <laughs> profit and revenue from this. Whereas Kodak eventually, uh, you know, declared bankruptcy. So, There's a story there about, hey, maybe we should try. And then maybe you follow that up with a story of a company that 
tried something, but small. Maybe they piloted something. Maybe they did a test and they learned from that. And then, wow, they found where there was a market for something. And then that's when they invested in it and doubled down. And then you use those stories to say, that's what I want to do here. I'm not saying let's go full gangbusters and invest everything in this, but I'm saying we might be onto something. We could be onto the next digital camera and I don't want to be Kodak. I want to be Sony. Yeah. Right. But let's test it. Let's pilot it. Now you've got some stories from, you know, very historic, famous companies and things that have happened. And you're relating that back to what you're trying to do. So different ways that you can use stories to win people's hearts and minds. It's it's a proof statement, right? Yeah. Yep. So, um, so I, I want to just play this out as I think about someone in the CX space listening, perhaps, uh, who's interested in getting their ideas, uh, supported in some way by leadership of some kind. Um, so I don't know, t- typically, uh, one thing I might, I might want to do is redesign and ex- based on the data that, that we've collected. Uh, so we've collected data. We've seen some customer complaints about a particular thing. Um, I'll think of one that comes to mind right now, which may be true for a lot of companies, is there's this ongoing tension between the customer experience and ease for customers and security. Security and safety, uh, you know, particularly online, is also in the customer's interest, tends to be more long-term interest like if you blow it once and let's say you're a bank um <laughs> you know and they have access to your funds or even if you're not you could any anywhere they've access to your funds or your personal data there's a high there's a huge risk on the other hand there's you know you clamp down too hard and it really affects the experience to some point where they're saying wait a minute i don't have to go through this with your competitor you know it's much easier mm-hmm. so therefore I'm going to switch. So you collect some data. You've 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 seen that customers are really complaining about the security level, <clears throat> and now you're seeing other data like satisfaction and net promoter scores to go along with the complaints. Um, and now you're maybe even getting some additional feedback. And then you're but you but you're going up against the chief information security officer and the chief risk officer maybe. Uh, maybe even the CIO who are saying, wait a minute, we, we're playing not to lose, right? We got to yeah. be defensive. So as I'm, as I'm sharing all this, I just made it up on the spot, but it's an example of something the CX person struggles with. It's like, hey, I, I want to support security, but we're, we're potentially losing customers. And we're taking customers yeah. who otherwise would love us to just going to like and because a big part yeah. of what you and I agree with is indifferent customers are a lot different than customers who are loyal fans. A lot, lot yeah. different. So, yeah. So how and would you the begin? The CX to leader. Re- yeah. Yeah. The, the, the CX leader is really in a, a tough position in, in a lot of companies, right? Because when you look at the different parts of an organization, marketing and sales, well, it's easy to see how that they and what they do directly relates to new revenue and new customers right yeah. you look at operations a customer service you can see okay this is us keeping the lights on you can see um you know the more units we produce the more efficient we are the more customers we can serve right you 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 look at the uh, finance side of the company and where it's all the numbers it's easy to kind of justify things Whereas in the customer experience world, it's a little more subjective, not as much qualitative to say, we just did this and it directly related to that. So it does put them in a bit of a a tough position. And this is where stories can, can really help. And I think negative stories can really help sway people as well. Like if you can tell the story of some individual customers and the ex- the negative experience they had with your company and why it caused them to go to your competitors that can be just as powerful as a good f- good you know good news story this security measures that we put in place was so dramatically impacting our customer experience in a negative way here's what happened to John Doe here's what they did and here's what they told us right and, and that's just one customer 
imagine there's a thousand John Doe's out there that experience that same thing. We're in trouble, right? We're going to start bleeding customers. Retention is going to go down. Loyalty is going to go down. So you have to have those stories. You have to have those personal stories to, to be able to bring to the table to help sway people beyond just the numbers. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to bring those to life, you know, if you've got quotes, um, if you can somehow capture the customers on video, sharing their own stories. Yeah. I know there's a lot of software tools out there these days that can help you do that. Yeah. I, I love to, I love to start every team meeting with a, with a customer story, right? Who's got one. And it doesn't have to be me who, who has a great, good feel customer story from the last week or month that you can share with the rest of the team, right? Who's got a, who's got a negative customer story that we need to learn from, right? I encourage team members to bring those because that's where it really feels real, right? We're not just talking numbers here. We're not just talking revenue anymore. We're talking people and we're talking real experiences that we need to share and understand the impact of what we do here. Yeah. Yeah. We had to that point, just to affirm what you're saying, we had um, something called the client experience leadership council at the bank, which is sort of a governance body uh, around the the work that we did in CX and the projects we managed, uh, portfolio projects we managed. And we started every meeting off with CX stories, like real customer stories and what happened yeah. in your area. Love it. And it's a powerful way to, to remind them of why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah. It, it's so easy to forget, yeah. right? You get, you get caught up in reports, you get caught up in standard operating procedures, you get caught up in strategies and budgets. At the end of the day, we're serving people. Yeah. Who are these people? What's the experience they're having with our brand? Let's, let's tell those stories and keep that front and center. Right. I exactly. Um, well, before we, so we, we got into some really good things and I, I appreciate that. I think it's just a really critical reminder if, uh, a CX person in an organization, or really true for any leader, is going to be effective, going to influence others, um, and become trustworthy as a leader themselves. They need to be good at storytelling. Yeah. Yep. Steve Jobs would tell us the the most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. Mm. So so true. And and. And that, and you're you're a great storyteller. And if you haven't read Accidental Solopreneur or Zero In, um, please do. And I know Dennis, you help actually people now with those interested in potentially writing a book, don't you? I do. That was one of the things that after after the success of the last two books, a, a lot of people were reaching out wanting to pick my brain. So I, I created a online self paced course called the Author's Playbook, where I just try and share everything I know about writing, editing, publishing, and, and marketing a great book. So, so, so some people, uh, and I put myself in this category, are, are thinking writing a book is such a heavy lift. Um, I don't even know where to begin or like, what's the, what's the main benefit of writing a book and how can you make it easier for people? Yeah, I was in that same boat as well. Like before I wrote my first book, I thought, man, what am I getting myself into? Um, what you don't know, you don't know, right? And when I started looking around, it was like, oof, man, a book coach was going to charge me anywhere from like three to five thousand dollars. There's these different vanity presses out there that say we'll we'll get your book out to the world, but again, thousands and thousands of dollars. Um I spoke to a bunch of authors and they all told me, go the self-published route. Um, you have to do most of the marketing yourself anyway as an author, even if you have a publishing deal. And most people buy their books on Amazon nowadays and you don't need a publisher to get your book on Amazon. So I soaked up as much as I could about self-publishing, um, spent a ton of time learning and now I just sell this course for anybody else who wants to do it at only $75 and saves them Ooh. thousands of dollars. But to answer your question, what does a book do for you? Well, if you're somebody like me, who's a coach or consultant, having a book behind your name suddenly gives you that instant credibility, right? Author of yeah. that immediately people see you as, well, you're the expert then you've written the book about it. So if, if you really need to increase your credibility, if you want to have something solid behind your name, 
um, to help with your personal brand, putting out a good book uh, for me, it it exponentially, you know, took took my my name and my business to the next level. Well, um, so so I highly recommend Dennis for any of the above that we talked about. Um, Dennis, I want to end the our conversation today, which I could keep going for a long, long time with you. You know that. Uh, about asking the same question I ask uh, all my guests, which is, what advice would you give to your twenty-year-old self? Mm. I twenty-year-old Dennis was extremely risk-averse. Um, I was trying to do everything the safe way and just, you know, avoid risk. Mm-hmm. Now I've learned that you know taking some calculated risks in life um, really helps you get to the next level, and it makes for some great stories. Ah, there you go, there you go, Dennis. Um, how would if someone wanted to get a hold of you, uh, reach out to you? What would be the best way? Yeah, probably probably two ways. My my website dennisgeelan.me is a great way to see uh, everything about me and what I offer. And if you want more of a personal connection, reach out and connect with me on on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to connect with new interesting people. Excellent. I so enjoyed our time together today. Uh, we'll talk more next time on the Delighted Customers podcast about stories. This time, not necessarily in the book, but in the film fashion and I'm going to reveal a little bit of a personal secret as we get into that uh, and we'll talk with a filmmaker so uh, excited about that and this is a perfect setup for as Dennis laid out the framework for story writing why it's so important how to go about it why it's critical to see sweet leaders and ha- and uh, just some great tips and observations from Dennis Dennis thanks so much for being on the show yeah thanks so much for having me Mark Thanks for listening to the Delighted Customers Podcast. I'd like to ask you a favor. If you have enjoyed this episode or any of my other ones, hit subscribe or follow. I've got a lot of other great guests that are coming up and a lot of other great content, and I don't want you to miss anything. You can find any links or references on the show in the show notes, and you can find those on my website at empoweredcx.com.